All right, welcome everybody. I am Alexander Romero, Senior Director of VMware Cross Cloud Services, and very excited to welcome you here to our first uh, LinkedIn Live of a multi-cloud expedition series, where we're gonna tackle a number of the multi-cloud challenges with subject matter experts from around VMware. So we're to kick it off today with this very first session. Number one, we're live, and uh, we were testing microphones beforehand. Um, and as fate would have it, there's always something that uh, could come up. So being live, uh, expect anything. Um, but to begin with, really this, this first series, there's, there's a couple of things I wanted to level set on. And so number one, when we talk about multi-cloud, what does that mean, right? There's, there's uh, numerous kind of definitions that float around from different vendors. But when we speak to multi-cloud, we're really talking about uh, everything from on-premises, to private clouds, to the hyperscalers, to sovereign clouds, all the way out to the edge, right? And the multi-cloud expedition is that expedition that customers are going through right now as they're using multiple clouds in order to achieve their business and outcomes. And as they add those clouds, right, that really does add a lot of complexities because they are recreating or developing brand new processes in an AWS or in a Microsoft Azure, um, as well as they've got to maintain, of course, all of their applications that are running on premises. Um, many, probably 80% of those moder are modern applications, or I should say are um, enterprise applications that run the business, yet they want to take advantage of those multi-cloud capabilities. So, Whew, there's a lot to go through when looking at multi-cloud, everything from platform operations, to application development, to disaster recovery, you name it. Um, and if it's involved in, in uh, running the business, then it probably, it probably touches or could touch a multi-cloud operation. So to begin with today, we're going to focus primarily on accelerating application development, right? And one of the huge benefits of modern application development is this faster you know, speed at which applications can be developed. At the same time, though, um, doing it in multiple clouds or even in a cloud native environment can be a challenge. So Joining me today are a number of subject matter experts, um, beginning with, and I'd like to welcome to the program, Deb. So Deb is joining us today. She's got a tremendous experience from the field and would love her to just take a moment to introduce herself. Oh, well, thank you, Alexander. My name is Deb Shum, and I'm a senior client executive here at VMware. I just celebrated my seventh anniversary with VMware last week, and I own the business relationship between VMware and three of our largest clients here in Florida. Thank you for inviting me to participate today. Yeah, fantastic. Welcome to the program. And uh, together, right, you work also with another guest that I'd like to join, another subject matter expert from VMware, and that's Chris. So Chris, please uh, welcome to the program and uh, please introduce yourself. Hey, thanks, Alexander. Yeah, Chris Delashment. Uh, I'm a principal solutions engineer uh, I've been with VMware for about 10 years, but most of my previous career was in software engineering and architecture. So on the development side, delivering applications. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And uh, both of you have seen many changes in the application development process, as well as how customers are um, meeting some of the challenges. Now, when, when I've gotten the chance and I, I get to speak regularly with customers uh, and we'll talk about multi-cloud and, and how the industry and the architecture are changing, one of the, the questions that always comes up is they say, you know, where do we start? Because in some ways this can seem overwhelming, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to brand new APIs, brand new containers, all of this stuff, finding new people. And so Deb, you've had some great experience with customers uh, directly who have brought you challenges and then uh, VMware has helped, you know, really to solve them. So uh, maybe you could share a little bit more about some of the, the, uh, the background to, to how the customer approach, you know, how you began those discussions and then what some of the next steps were. Okay, sure, Alexander. I'm happy to talk about that a little bit. And so when you look at companies that are trying to modernize their applications, you really need to figure out why, what's, what's the value for the company that if you were able to modernize the apps. Some companies are faced with competitive threats, 
They might be looking to innovate. Uh, they might just have application issues that they need to resolve. Like everybody that knows anything about this 30 year old application has retired. And where they struggle is getting new product features out to the marketplace in a timely fashion, which can have a direct impact on their bottom line. And then even in today's economy, right? We've got companies that have hiring constraints. So if they have the money to hire, they may not be able to find the people. And so in some cases, they just want a company to come in and get the job done right on time and within budget. Chris, did you add anything to that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think the, the kind of direct engagement, uh, helping customers um, modernize applications is, is definitely one of the aspects of how labs can help. But um, we can also come in, I think, with labs and help with direct pairing with existing teams. So help them kind of get up to speed with, you know, cloud native modern best practices for applications, um, doing that through direct pairing. Um, but we can also broaden that scope too, right? There's things we can do to actually uh, help organizations kind of look at their portfolio, assess the entire portfolio for modernization, um, you know, kind of bucket the different applications into, you know, do we leave this one alone? Do we, is this one actually going to make a lot of sense for us to modernize? So, so come up with the actual program around modernization. That's another area we can we can definitely help out. Um, and then even uh, partner with not just the development teams, but also the architects and operators to help create uh, platforms which are really conducive for accelerated development, right? So, so stuff where uh, developers are not having to kind of figure out all the complexities of all the particular clouds that you want to deploy into provide them kind of a consistent experience across all those things. So we can help out in a lot of different ways. Yeah, and we're going to show some of that uh, a little bit later in the program. Uh, Deb, you had mentioned that uh, one of the challenges that, that one of your customers was facing was, you know, going back to that question of, of where to start and even scoping. And this was something that I found, you know, very valuable to, to understand how Tanzu Labs, right, that professional team that's got tremendous experience across numerous customers can kind of look at that problem and then say, let's get started on this piece. And right. I think you had a good example, the uh, the uh, the length of time that it took. So maybe you could share a little bit more about how they went from, you know, maybe kind of what looked like boiling the ocean, so to speak, to a uh, real time to value. OK, yeah, I'm happy to share an example. We've done a few Tanzu Labs engagements here in Florida, and uh, one that kind of strikes a lot to me it was the value that we were able to bring is we had a client that had a mission critical customer facing application and they needed to modernize that app just because the consumer how they wanted to buy their tastes were changing and so they needed to modernize it so they could more quickly make changes to it in order to get more money from their from their clients and they were in the analysis paralysis phase when they brought tanzu labs in and what tanzu labs was able to do very quickly very surgically is to get it down to, all right, we're going to develop this one feature and we're going to get it out into production within a certain amount of time. And as Chris said, it was pairing. So it was one client person to one Tanzu Labs person. While one person was writing code, the other one was writing test scripts and they would, they would switch off. And so two heads are really better than one. And they were actually able to successfully move this one piece of code that was customer facing into production within six months. So that's a great example of get it done, get it done quickly and move on. And that customer, go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, I was telling you. I was gonna say, from what I remember, that customer had not done anything like that in that particular cloud previously. So mm -hmm. this was really starting with kind of people understanding and the technology. We're gonna we're gonna get to the technology and some of the technology pieces that can help accelerate things in a moment. But uh, definitely wanted to to impress upon you know folks that are watching how just the the knowledge that Tanzu Labs can bring around process as well as on focus and scoping and and kind of knowing where the pitfalls are is one of the, the huge important pieces for those that aren't sure where to get started or in analysis paralysis. And sorry, Chris, I didn't mean to uh, jump in before you. No, no, it's okay. I just wanted to add one little point. Um, you know, Deb, I, you mentioned the pairing with developers and I think that's a huge aspect to what we do with labs. But mm -hmm. another thing which sometimes folks overlook 
is this idea of treating the um, the application, the effort that you're going through as a product and staffing folks like product managers, not project managers, but product managers who can actually help interface with the business, help kind of yeah. prioritize that sort of thing. That's a function that often gets, I would say, in a lot of organizations that I've worked with overlooked. And that's a function we can help bring through labs to help train up your development organization with product managers that know how to kind of uh, get in and again, prioritize backlogs, that sort of thing. So um, just th there's a lot of ways we help as far as that's concerned. Yeah. yeah, I feel like that could be an entire episode, Chris, just on product managers uh, at, right, at our customers that are in the IT organization versus project managers. Okay. We're going to save that one for another, uh, another day. But uh, with that, Deb, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, appreciate the information about some of the customers you've uh, helped uh, drive business outcomes for. So I'm sure we'll, we'll have you back on the, uh, on the live series shortly. Wonderful. Uh, Absolutely. By the way, for those that are online, if you uh, hear anything that catches your interest and you've got a question or you want to dive uh, deeper into it, I've got a number of other subject matter experts that are not on camera, but are manning the uh, comments and chat window. And they will also uh, surface any questions when we get to the Q&A at the end, uh, or if it's something that's, uh, that seems very relevant or welcome to jump into the, to the broadcast and make us aware of the questions. So by all means, if you're listening, uh, feel free to ask any questions. Okay, so Chris, when we were kind of exploring and, and kind of thinking about that first point in terms of you know, getting to faster, app, basically getting, getting apps out the door faster, right, in a multi-cloud environment. Um, one thing that comes up is, well, now that we know a little bit about, you know, people in process, and again, it was, it was a brief, brief uh, intro to Tanzu Labs, but gave that kind of background. Uh, let's transition and dive a little bit into what kind of technologies can help a customer so that they can get up to speed, fa their developers really can get up to speed faster and thus get, get applications out faster. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and, and I would even say there's there's definitely products that can help. It's it's almost a, a way of thinking about some of this too. I think it, it, holistically about how do we provide a dial tone to developers that kind of is speaking their language, the language of apps, right? As opposed to say the language of infrastructure. And you know, I think that's where uh, a lot of organizations struggle, right? Is there's lots of great tools out there for um, doing things like automating infrastructure, trying to kind of uh, uh, simplify uh, access to the clouds, that sort of thing. But I think they forget kind of the the starting point that a lot of developers are coming at it from. Like, so I was a developer, like I said, for a, a big part of my early career. And, um, you know, what, what do you do when you start a project, right? What's the first thing you do? Okay, well, here's the kind of pattern that we think we want to go follow. You know what? let's go search Stack Overflow and see if we can find something, or let's go search GitHub or something like that to see if we can find a pattern which kind of matches the type of app that we want to, to deliver. You know, it's integrating uh, OAuth and uh, it's talking to a database and that sort of stuff, right? So, so that's what you do, right? Any self-respecting developer is gonna go out and look for some good patterns, right? Um, now, the there's, trouble there's is- no There's no reason to reinvent the wheel there, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. exactly, right? I mean, it, it, the, the, you, you wanna build on top of like, proven patterns, right? That's the idea here. And mm -hmm. again, like nobody wants to waste a lot of time trying to redo something that somebody else has already done well, right? So so you find these patterns, right? Um, you know, and I think, I think the challenge sometimes is uh, a lot of organizations, you know, have some opinions about what are the best patterns for the types of applications they deliver, right? Um, like that OAuth thing I was talking about, right? You know, there's, there's a variety of ways to integrate authentication into applications. Like, is OAuth the right one for your organization? Maybe it is, um, but there's patterns for all kinds of different ways to integrate, you know, directly to LDAP and other things. So, so the idea here is that like developers have to spend a lot of time kind of combing the internet to find like what are those right patterns to start their apps from, right? So I think that's one, I would say that's one key thing that is a, a big starting kind of point that, that starts to sap a lot of time from developers. Now I'd say the second thing that I've seen is getting access to the right infrastructure right in the first place um if you think about like we're talking about the multi-cloud challenge here right um if you think about like 
the complexity of any one single cloud, all the different types of services it can offer, all the different APIs and interfaces it provides, like all of that complexity can be overwhelming. Um, and then when you talk about doing that in multiple clouds, you sort of have to <laughs> go through that whole learning process again and again for each one of these different clouds. It's hard to find people that, uh, first of all, are experts in any one particular cloud, uh, but second, are experts in multiple clouds, right, all at the same time. That's a that's a tough skill set to find, and it's in high demand. Um, so one of the things you want to try and do is make it so that it is very easy for developers to get into the environments that they need to deliver their applications to very quickly, right? So lower the amount of resources they need on their desktops, lower the you know, the cognitive dissonance between where they're at and where they're trying to get to in the public cloud, uh, but get them into the right spots so they can deliver their application. So I would say like those are two main things that I see um, uh, impacting a lot of organizations. Mm -hmm. And we've got, uh, you know, a great way to support that. And, and you mentioned a number of things that we hear from customers over and over again. One is definitely very difficult to hire and, and hire people with this expertise. But then if we look at the last example where Deb was talking about, you know, time to market between when they got in and they actually got the code out to production, that's six months, relatively fast for, a first, for the first time around. But if you're talking about bringing somebody in brand new, training them not only on the company, but then on the processes, et cetera, you're looking at a lot more time. So uh, we've got a, a good demo, a demonstration of uh, Tanzu product called Accelerators. And let's go ahead and run that and then uh, let the audience view it. Uh, then we'll, we'll kind of point out some highlights afterwards. For a good starting point, I usually have two options. Number one, I can clone an existing Git repository, or I just have to find something and start it myself. With Tanzu Application Platform, you can use Application Accelerator to actually help you start your project. As you see on the screen here, this is our Application Accelerator menu or view, and it basically has a library of applications or starting points to applications to start a project. Since I'm going to be working on building a new sensor application, I want to find something here that will be suitable. So I will try to look for the Spring Sensors application here and we can find it real quick. There it is. So we'll choose it and this will open up a form for us to fill out to do any customizations to the code before it is downloaded. There's, these are all different options based on which accelerator you choose. So we'll just leave the, the normal ones here and then go to the next step. The next step will be just to create the tarball or zip file. And so the, the zip file gets created and then we'll just simply download it and we'll be ready to start our project. Now that we have our starting code, the second thing I need is good tooling. The IDE is where I want to do all of my coding, testing, and debugging. Since this application will ultimately be running on Kubernetes, I also need a way to easily run it that way. Fortunately, with the live update feature of Tanzu Application Platform, I am now able to stay in my IDE even when my code is running on Kubernetes. Let's see how it works. First, let's check localhost, make sure nothing is currently running. Uh, we're good to go. So let's go back to our, our IDE. And to start this um, live update, all we need to do is right click on a tilt file that's part of the accelerator. And let's start the application uh, Tanzu up live update. And what this is going to do is actually use the supply chain to actually build an image for me based on the source code push it to a registry, and then actually deploy it and run it on Kubernetes, and I'll be able to, to look at what's happening live. All right, so the process will start. Um, you can see the log messages will start to scroll here uh, for the build and the other things that the supply chain um, is doing. So we'll wait a few minutes for the application to restart with its changes a couple times, and then we'll go check our browser to see if we have a running application. All right, it looks like our application is coming up. It's receiving the data. We can tell by one of those messages there that says it's receiving data. Um, so let's go check out our browser. We go to localhost 8080 and we'll have, see our running application. The Tanzu sensor database application up and running. So yeah, that was you know a, a great example of where 
So developer comes in, right? And uh, in a perfect world, there's a great onboarding process for that developer and everything is laid out nicely. Uh, that's, that's the world we want, but that's not usually the world that exists. So being able to go in, search for common patterns like you were talking about before, and then find them, and use them and deploy them is kind of a big deal. There was a lot going on in that demo though. And I think towards the end was what was actually pretty interesting in, in an area I'd like you to elaborate on a little bit more, which is not only was the code in that particular accelerator, but there was a second component that enabled that deployment. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what was all inside of that pre-made accelerator. Yeah, exactly. I think the, I think the thing at the end um, to me is also one of the most important things too, right? Is the fact that as a developer, um, you know, you, what, what are you trying to do? You want to optimize that cycle of iteration, right? So you want to be able to write some code, uh, you know, see the results of that, um, and then, you know, potentially fix any problems that come up, right? And keep going through that cycle as fast as possible. So, um, the challenge with that, especially when you talk about deploying apps to Kubernetes is that, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that you might have to try and set up locally to try and make that possible, right? A, a, a kind of a miniature local Kubernetes environment, or you have to sort of deal with the, well, I'm running this locally, so I'm going to configure it completely differently. But then when I deliver it to the cluster, it's got a different configuration. I hope they're, you know, I hope I've got it right. I hope I got things right so that I, I'll see any problems that'll come up. What I think was cool about that, that demo was it showed that the accelerator already had the application um, project pre-configured, ready to go with this live update capability. And what that does is it lets the developer uh, uh, ask for that application to basically get scheduled in a cluster that's built for rapid iteration, right? Um, with this live update capability, they can go in and not only does it start the app running, but they're also able to make changes locally and it's changing the code in that running application in the cluster. So it's bit, it, now you wouldn't want to do this in production, right? This is this is optimized for iteration, mm -hmm. but but the the fact that it's it's sort of purpose built for the developers to get started there, go through that cycle really rapidly, and then get to the point where they're ready to deliver an application much faster. Like the friction is massively reduced there. They don't have to set up anything other than get my IDE, grab this project, and I'm immediately productive. Yeah, and that's going to tee us up for our next demo, which uh, hold off, don't run it yet, but talking about path to production, because <laughs> I want to I want to pose this question to you, which is within that accelerator, right? And within that um, that deployment, in my head, I'm just thinking of if that's a brand new developer and they were trying to do all of that from scratch, you're talking about opening tickets, maybe multiple tickets with platform op, with an operations team, with a security team, with even, you know, maybe they're texting their, their, uh, you know, DMing their, their colleague who turns out isn't around that week, but knew the exact address of where this thing has to deploy. Right. And so there's like all these things that actually happen right in, in the real world. And this simplifies and, uh, eliminates a lot of it and abstracts it away from the developer having to worry about that. So yeah, absolutely. It's a huge time saver. Yeah. So let's let's switch gears. And the way, as we switch gears, it's kind of like we're going up in gears, right? We're talking began with talking about how do we just get started when we're not sure as a customer. Tanzu Labs can jump in there with people in process. Uh, those product managers, super important, right? Then, okay, now what's some of the tech behind there to help them, those accelerators? Now let's look a little bit more towards put it in another gear higher to path to production. So uh, Shannon, if you could roll the, uh, the next demo, it would be fantastic. Now that I've done my work, I need that easy path to production. The awesome thing with Tanzu Application Platform is I don't need to do anything special. The same supply chain I use to build and deploy my code live is the same as the path to production. Usually, this would require a wall of YAML and config files to build my images and deploy them to Kubernetes. Luckily, we can do everything we need with the one simple YAML file you see on the screen here. It's called the workload.yaml file. This is the only thing needed. As you can see, you tell it what Git repo to watch. Um, you see the section about uh, services claims. That's how I was actually able to use my Rabbit database automatically during my live reload. The same file will be used to deploy it to production. One thing you may have noticed during this demo is I didn't show a single Kubernetes command. That's the beauty of Tanzu application platform. 
To get a glimpse of what gets created on my cluster, here is a listing of my default namespace to see what was created for us. At this point, I'm ready to check in my code and send it to production. Yeah, you know, it's funny when we watched that, uh, uh, that demo before, I said there wasn't a lot to that demo. And then uh, you responded with, well, that's the whole point. So maybe yeah. we'll talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think what's great about this is that the, the, the way that the platform is built is that you have this very simple specification, right? The simple contract that you can offer to your developers that's, that says, hey, just give me the things that only you know, like where, what repo is your source code in? Um, maybe a high level kind of hint about what type of app is this? Is it a web app or a background process or something like that? But you give these very basic uh, kind of constructs through a contract to your developers. It's really clear about uh, here's what we need you to tell us. But then all the opinions, right? All the uh, best practices that uh, your architects and operators kind of built up about running that application in the particular cloud that it's ultimately destined for is baked into the platform, right? You basically configure the platform to say, oh, well, this application is a web worker type application. You know what? Uh, we want you to uh, make sure that application is running multiple instances. In fact, it's, it's actually able to scale to zero. Uh, it scales up as demand comes in so that operationally we're not having to go in and kind of manually scale things up and down, that sort of thing. We can, we can sort of scale the platform orthogonally to that, right, potentially. Um, and it just does, it keeps the developers from having to be exposed to all of this infrastructural complexity, right? So it helps them focus on just the things they need to focus on, right, again, which is the code, right? Um, and then the fact that you're able to build in those, those opinions and kind of strategies um, on top of the things the platform already provides you uh, allows you to customize that for the different clouds that you're deploying to. So that, for example, if a developer says something like, uh, I, I need a MySQL database, and it's literally that simple, right? If you look at the contract, they can go in and just say, give me a MySQL database. That need can get expressed in a bunch of different ways that can differ ben depending upon the cloud you're on, that can differ depending upon even the app lifecycle life life stage you're in, right? So in dev, maybe it's cheaper and easier to just say, you know what, just, just run this uh, database as an in-cluster uh, set of uh, resources. Um, but when we're in production, maybe we want to use the cloud provider's uh, database implementation. The contract stays the same. Developers just say, I need MySQL. But the operational aspect of where that app is getting deployed can, can change in the way it's implemented right behind the scenes. So it's, it's really a smooth process then for developers and operators. Operators aren't having to get kind of involved in every single little uh, deployment. And developers only have to worry about the minimal things that they need to uh, express what needs they have. So it's a really great system. Yeah, this is uh, definitely something that, you know, customers are figuring out along the way. And when I say figuring it out, I mean, there's been, of course, a tra traditional infrastructure and operations team with the on-premises, um, you know, enterprise applications. And they're, you know, rooted in that is tremendous uh, expertise, right, in waterfall capabilities. And you've got, you know, the the um, uh, proper security and everything. And now there's really that need, especially in um, modern apps, to figure out that path to production, but not just figure it out, productize it. So this is where customers are beginning to develop platform engineering or platform operations teams. Now, the interesting thing about it is sometimes they are doing this solely in the cloud, um, and maybe a business unit that needs it. And it's not necessarily that structured or a, as refined as it was historically with the you know, I, you know, infrastructure and operations team that's been doing it for years. But they're finding, you know what, we need the same thing, right? When we need the same thing, I'm meaning the, uh, we want the deployment to go very quickly, right? We want to uh, abstract away the complexity for the developer for a number of different reasons. Number one, they're probably not a security expert, right? Or they're not an operational capacity expert, right? They're, they should just be doing what they do best, which is developing the applications. Um, and so being able to have that platform operations team to abstract that and the technologies to support that is, uh, is super important. And it kind of ties to the next piece, which is that path to production has got many different components. 
uh, one of the big ones, security, right? And so with security, there's the, the need and the interest to try to shift that security more to the left uh, so that we're not, I should say, um, you know, uh, the final checks that are done are not done at the last minute, only to send it all the way back to the developer and then thus delay the, uh, the rollout, go back to the drawing board, et cetera. So uh, with that, I want to go ahead and roll the last demo that we have today, which is around that shifting security left, as well as some of the different pieces in that deployment chain. These paths of production are defined in the Tanzu application platform as supply chains, and for this application, we'll demonstrate an out-of-the-box supply chain, which for a given source code location will test the code, scan the code for vulnerabilities, build and sign a container image, scan the resulting image for vulnerabilities, and finally, apply standardized configurations and deploy the applications to a Kubernetes cluster. Now that we've reviewed the steps of the out-of-box testing and supply chain, let's take a look at how this works by deploying the Spring Sensors application, which Aaron just completed developing. We'll start by creating our workload via the Tanzu CLI. The workload.yaml, which was included from the application accelerator scaffolding, provides the Tanzu application platform with the information required to deploy our application. Once we submit this, choreography takes over to step through the supply chain we outlined previously. In order to watch cartographers step through the supply chain, let's watch the pods that are being launched and examine each step. As mentioned, the first step in our supply chain is to perform our integration tests, and you can see that the testing pod has automatically started. Since the Spring Sensors application was built using Maven, we are simply performing a Maven test to run our suite of tests defined for the application. This can take a moment, so let's skip ahead. As you can see, there were no failures in our tests. Now that testing is completed, let's see how the supply chain puts the security in DevSecOps. As you can see, the next pod that has been launched is a scan pod, which is using the Gripe image scanner to scan the application source code for any vulnerabilities. The result of the scan will be compared against our defined scan policy to determine if the deployment can continue. Before looking at the results, Let's take a look at that policy. Note that our policy defines that any critical or high severity vulnerabilities will violate our policy and cause our deployment to fail. Now, let's take a look at the results. We can see in these results that the scan completed successfully and no CVEs were found on the source code. These results are also uploaded to the Tanzu application platform's metadata store for archiving. We'll take a look at those a bit later. After the scan phase, a build pod is kicked off. The next step of our supply chain is to build the image using the Tanzu build service, which uses cloud native build packs to build OCI compliant container images using years of best practices and optimizations and security from the open source community. These build packs analyze the source code to determine if they are applicable, and if so, are executed against the source code to build the required layer images, which removes the need for your operations and development teams to build and maintain Docker files, which streamlines the build process. As mentioned, this is the same process that was used to build Aaron's development image, which promotes consistency between development and production. Again, this process can take some time, so let's fast forward to the end. Since this passes our security policy of no critical or high severity vulnerabilities, this deployment will be allowed to continue. If we wanted to search for any images that had a specific vulnerability, we could do that as well. This would allow your organization's operations team to quickly find any applications which have been deployed on the Tanzu application platform with a specific vulnerability. The final step in our supply chain is to use pre-approved conventions for the workload type and deploy the application to your Kubernetes cluster. These conventions prevent your development and operation teams from having to build and maintain the quote-unquote wall of YAML that's typically associated with getting an application running in Kubernetes. Let's take a look at the Tanzu application platform GUI to see our deployed Spring Sensors application. From here, we have a wealth of information about the application at our fingertips, including the team who owns the application, where to find the source code, and any supporting tech docs. If you drill into the workload, we can see all the metadata available for the workload, as well as the routes and revisions of the deployed application. By following the URL, we can see that our application has been successfully deployed to our production cluster and is gathering information from our sensors. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot going on there. So uh, maybe we can unpack a couple of the components. Um, start Maybe starting actually from the end of the demo, which 
had that GUI and the GUI, right? All this information was being reported up to that GUI, but maybe you could talk a little bit about how that benefits, you know, does it benefit developers or is it more for the platform operations people or is it both? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both, right? Um, you know, there's increased, um, uh, I would say interest in um, organizations really trying to get a handle on uh, can I validate all of the components that go into the supply chain that build out my application, right? And there's a lot of talk around some of the folks, some, some folks on the, on the uh, live stream here might have heard this, this concept of software bill of materials, right? So being able to, to grab all of those components that go into building an application so that you can go back and validate that against CVEs, you can attest to the fact that uh, you know you've you've handled or mitigated the CVE. All of that information, I think, is super useful both from a fleet-wide perspective, right? Just being able to get a sense of what's the security posture of my fleet of applications, but also down to an application team level because when they see those things, right, they can actually go and validate. For example, okay. Uh, can we update, you know, versions of libraries to make sure that we get that uh, CVE handled, or can we apply whatever mitigating, um, you know, uh, code we need to uh, to handle that situation? So I think it really does help uh, on both sides of the fence there. Yeah, and so that you know, I'm kind of thinking of those those real world examples again, which is developers are, you know, they're not thinking about every CVE that's being published, right? Nor should they. So um, but they also don't want to be in the situation where security comes and says, why didn't you patch this CV? And they go, well, how was I supposed to know that was even an issue with my code? And well, what's neat about that, too, actually, that you mentioned that and they didn't show this in the demo. Um, the, the system that the application platform uses to build images is actually actually proactively monitoring for some of those things. Right. So, for example, um, if there's a CVE that comes out in, um, you know, a library that's included in the base image that you're building your application on, right? First of all, the build system provides these trusted base images for, for running, for basing your application on top of. But second, uh, it's actually proactively monitoring whenever there are updates. And if there's a patch for something like a CVE, it will actually proactively go out and rebuild that container image. So you're already staged and ready to go with the latest CVE patches for a lot of those problems that emerge, right? So there's actually sort of a, to, to your point, like not having to monitor all the CVEs, the build system for the, for the container images actually is working for you 24 seven, like monitoring those things and getting them applied. Um, and then you can choose like how much automation you want to allow for that. Do you want to automatically roll those out or do you want to, you know, make sure it's just staged and ready for the next deployment? So I think that's a huge, uh, um, you know, improvement on the security posture for apps. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that might be another, another one of those to deep dive into in a future episode because customers are definitely asking automation. I hear automation, 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 um, but, automation and maybe we'll stick with this one example then we'll move on it'd be good to hear maybe a little bit more about how that platform supports it and the reason i say that is uh i've seen you know kind of a, a couple of funny examples where um you know experts are talking about well automation is not where you automate everything but then the last step and then the last step automatically opens a ticket that somebody has to then look at, right? That sits, it sits in a queue because the person's at lunch or they're not able to get to it, you name it, right? That's not great automation. Um, and maybe I digress a bit, but I think the point you just made, tell us a little bit more about how that, how maybe how the technology works or, or uh, just a little more info on it. Yeah, um, you know, I think kind of at the beginning, we talked about this whole concept of a supply chain, right, in that demo and um, this idea that what you're able to do, supply chains, a lot of times, by the way, people will look at supply chain and think, well, that's just CI or CD or something like that. What, what I like to say is that supply chain is actually bridging the gap between a CI system, which is sort of responsible for continuously running tests and making sure the app is, is you know, healthy from a code perspective, um, uh, to the point where you're actually ready to deploy. So, so supply chains really are um, uh, automating that kind of gap, if you will, between the two. What they're doing as well is they're wiring in all these policies that you have around security, around things like 
what's the right way to generate the manifest to deliver this application, right? Physically, how am I going to run it in my cluster? Um, am I scanning code? Am I scanning the image? Am I doing both? Am I enforcing signing, right, for those images? You kind of saw all that in the mm -hmm. process, right? Um, and then at the, at the end, right, once that application is ready to be delivered, again, you can take that all the way as far out into the process as you want for the lifecycle of that app so that it's automating, you know, the delivery to UAT if you want to. But a lot of organizations do want a little bit of kind of oversight of some of that process. What I think is beautiful about the supply chain system is it's configurable so that you can plug in your own stages. You can decide, is it something I want to operate continuously all the way out to production? Or is it something I do want to have, you know, that one final kind of manual uh, go, no go to allow that application to progress into production or not, right? So it's it's really built for you to be able to customize it to, to your particular needs and automate it out as far as you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, fantastic. And I should add that uh, although you're here as a subject matter expert from VMware, we recruited a couple of other great subject matter experts. And that was uh, Ryan Baker, uh, as well as Aaron Torg Torgerson, who developed those demonstrations and they were the voices on those uh, product demonstrations. So thank you very much to them also. Let's now, so we went through the main parts and before I, I go through concluding them, let's switch over to bring uh, Dan, who's uh, on the cross cloud services team, because he's got a couple of questions from the audience that have popped up. Yeah, really love the discussion guys. Um, I have a few questions from the audience. I've been monitoring um, the chat as it's come through. Uh, so let me pose the first question to you both. Um, and this is about the build versus buy decision with an internal developer platform. So can you elaborate on what the advantages of buying or maybe even just pro con the situation of buying a developer platform versus building your own? Chris, I'm let you start with that one. Okay, okay, great, yeah. Um, I think the big thing for me is that um, First of all, buying a developer platform, I think you get the advantage of not having to invent everything yourself or discover everything yourself. The, the ecosystem around even just Kubernetes, right, is humongous. Like if you go out to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation page, they have this awesome graphic that you've probably all seen, right, which sort of shows you the myriad of different options and projects there are out, out there just around the Kubernetes ecosystem. Now, that gets multiplied when you talk about wiring in cloud uh, provider native services, wiring in you know uh, on-premise services, other types of uh, uh, capabilities that are out there, and that that map gets humongous, right? So I think what's valuable about buying the platform uh, is that you you get a lot of those um, uh, kind of building blocks already pre-assembled, ready to go in, in a coherent way and a consistent way right, across those different provider environments, right? Whereas trying to build your own, can you get there? You can, right? The, a lot of these technology, in fact, the, the technologies that back Tanzu application platform are open source. So you could go out and assemble your own Tanzu application platform. But I think the challenge there is that you're spending a lot of time trying to get all those things wired together, working properly, that sort of thing. We've got, you know, hundreds of developers uh, working on this 20, you know, 24 seven, right around the world, basically, uh, we, we do let them take breaks occasionally, I hear, but, but they're working on this constantly. Whereas your organization, you're trying to focus on not only delivering your applications, but now also trying to build a platform. To me, that's where I think that build versus buy discussion really comes into play is like, what do you want to invest your time in getting your applications into production or trying to build the platform to help do that? I, you know, I'll add to that. I think there was a time, if you go back in time, where the uh, application platforms didn't exist and weren't really that robust. Because certainly when I've talked with uh, development engineers and development directors, uh, and but you got to go way back, like, you know, many years, they said, you know, at the time there just wasn't anything. So we did build our own, right? Um, they said, if, if stuff like Tanzu existed at that time, then by all means, that's what they would have done. Um, so that's the other one that I kind of hear. But thinking about what you just explained, it, it kind of goes back to shrinking the time to value, right? So if you want to go off and you want to develop your own entire application platform, 
certainly anybody can go do that. Is it going to most likely lengthen the amount of time to get something out? Yes, I think is the answer these days with the present uh, present uh, products that are available. Really specific quote from a customer that I've worked with. They looked at what we could do with Tanto application platform and looked back at us and said, you know what? This would accelerate our time to cloud by at least two to three years. So that's a huge savings in time deal. being able to have that. So yeah, I think that's I think it's a testament to like what the value that that platform brings to you to really get you far along your path. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, so the next question is about cost, and I know the applications we've been talking about, the business goals are generally revenue generating, finding new efficiencies in the business. But some of our audience is wondering, are there ways in which this approach with the Tanzu application platform or anything else you've discussed can help them lower their costs in any way? Yeah, this, you know, this is a, this is one that comes up quite frequently with our customers and where it, this goes back to kind of business goals, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, abstract this customer answer, but essentially um, there was a process that was a little bit manual uh, for a customer at scale. You're talking about millions of customers that need this particular process, right? And so right there in their initiatives is we are going to save a tremendous amount of money if we can take, this is the highest CEO level business outcome. If we can take that process and make it faster, if we can allow customers to service it themselves online through an application, as opposed to having to call in, right? We can save all of this money. So I think when, when one thinks about, okay, well, where's the cost savings in this? It actually rolls all the way up to probably the highest level initiatives and any highest high level initiative that's going to advance an organization uh, is going to require, and I'd probably, you know, I'd probably bet money on this, that 99.9% .9 of them are going to require IT operations in one way, shape, or form. And uh, this this goes back to as a great book, and probably many in the audience have have heard or read it called The Phoenix Project. And what was really interesting about that book is it made that point that if you tie anything a business wants to do, go pick a name out of the air, Fortune 500 or even a small company, most likely that new initiative or project is going to require some form of IT support, whether it's building a new application, right, launching a new campaign. Uh, simplifying things for users, getting things out to their sales team faster. And then the next question that comes up is, uh, assuming it's something that everybody's behind is great, when can we get this, right? And this is where all of this comes together to say, let's do it as fast as possible. So let's use the tools that are available and best practices to support that and thus achieve that either increase in revenue, right? If it's a, if it's a revenue generating business objective or save money because it's a re it's a uh, you know cost reduction type of program. So that was a very long answer, Chris. Feel free to jump in and, and add also kind of what you've seen. Yeah, one one kind of a, a different angle that I've seen from from uh, some customers I've interacted with as well is that if you look at the models for uh, how um, how to kind of get the most efficient uh, uh, use of the public cloud, right? It isn't the on demand model. That's that's great and it's got its place, but a lot of organizations, you know, especially when they start moving into the public cloud, um, uh, really want to opt for more committed spend, right? And the reason for that is you get a much deeper discount if you can tell the cloud provider, hey, here's how much I want to be able to, you know, spend uh, in your public cloud environment, you know, per year, right? The, they get these committed spend uh, agreements set up uh, with built-in discounts. And the trouble is, like, if you've got that sort of arrangement set up, which is going to give you kind of the best pricing, um, but your development teams can't get on board it and start using that stuff. You're just wasting money at that point, right? Your dev teams can't get their applications into those cloud environments fast enough, and you're but you're paying for all of those resources, right? So I think one of the things that kind of flipping that 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 cost angle around a little bit is thinking about like if that's the way you want to try and consume the cloud the most efficiently, then it behooves you to have a platform that allows developers to move rapidly into those environments so you can get the most value of that committed spend, right? So that's another angle around this, I think, that maybe sometimes people overlook 
when thinking about like moving into the cloud. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, awesome. Excellent. So one more question for you guys before we wrap up. Uh, and this one's about open source. So uh, maybe Chris, can you elaborate a little bit more? You mentioned a few things about Tanzu open source and the open source elements in the Tanzu portfolio. Um, but can you talk a bit about how our customers can use those to gain value in their organization um, and, and what those are specifically? Yeah, um, you know, so the demos really highlighted a few key aspects of the application platform. Um, the, the thing that's providing the supply chain capability, that's a project, open source project called Cartographer. Um, the, uh, I think they maybe showed a little brief uh, bit of, uh, as a developer, I want to be able to uh, connect to something like a, a RabbitMQ messaging service or some other backing service for my application. That's another open source project uh, or a collection of projects, really, uh, service bindings framework, right? Um, you know, there's the uh, there's Kubernetes itself, of course, but then the components we're laying on top of that, uh, things like the um, uh, system for building images, uh, that's the uh, KPAC open source project. Um, there's the system for uh, enforcing the uh, conventions that you have around how what's the best way to uh, configure an application that's going to run, say, in a Kubernetes environment. That's the um, uh, conventions service. So there's all these different open source services that we bundle together and make really easy to consume uh, as, far of Tan as part of Tanzu application platform. Um, you can absolutely go and grab those pieces and kind of pull them together yourself if you want to. But um, I think what's what's useful is if you don't want to go through all of the complexity of trying to wire those things together and configure them the right way, um, one of the things you can do uh, today is you can actually go out to, uh, there's a site, uh, tenzucommunity.io, I believe is what it is, uh, which is actually a way for you to get a lot of the capabilities we just saw today uh, in a package that you can start experimenting with yourself. Um, and and uh, understandably, like there are some components that are included uh, that, uh, that you might not be able to get to. Um, I don't think things like the security dashboard, kind of the the portfolio view of things is included there. Um, but if that's something you do want to take a look at, uh, I'd encourage you reach out to your uh, VMware account team. They can get you in contact with people who can get you access to those uh, capabilities and actually work with you to help understand those things a little bit better. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Dan. I appreciate you manning uh, some of that Q&A <laughs> from folks. Uh, so thank you very much. And of course. with that, yeah, absolutely. And so with that, uh, Chris, I think we're going to we're going to wind up and summarize kind of what we've gone through today. Uh, beginning right. This is exciting because this is one of the first episodes of the multi cloud expedition series and beginning there at the beginning uh, at the uh, I say the beginning stages of multi cloud, which is how to get apps out there and how to get them out there faster. Uh, first being people in process. Right. So we talked about Tanzu Labs in that example. Uh, next being, well, what about some technology to help those developers onboard faster? Accelerators came in there. We showed a great demo of that. Then, all right, we've got some of the code. How do we get that faster path to production? Path to production, right? And we went through that demo, which was a really short one because the, all the stuff happens behind the scenes, right? which, which is fantastic. Uh, then the last piece, which was really looking at how do we shift, you know, shift security to the left in that path to production so that we can, at the end of the day, get these applications out faster, no matter where they are, no matter which particular environment they're in, which cloud, hyperscaler, sovereign cloud, you name it, on-prem, uh, and Tanzu application platform can absolutely help with that. So those were all the major components. Wanted to see if you wanted to uh, add anything else that the audience should uh, take away. No, just uh, I, I like I said, uh, reach out to your local account team and uh, and like I said, go check out uh, TanzuCommunity.io and uh, yeah, just uh, reach out to us with questions and uh, we'd be glad to help. Awesome, Chris, fantastic having you on the program as well as Deb earlier, uh, great subject matter experts at VMware. I want to encourage everybody to go to visit the blog that is in the comments section as well as a bit of a teaser for our next series, which will be coming up in a few weeks. So if you follow the blog and if you subscribe to it, 
you'll be able to be notified when that next series date is. With that, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, all the behind the scenes folks, Shannon, Dan, Leanne, uh, quite a few folks behind the scene to help make this happen. And very much looking forward to the next uh, episode in the series. Take care. All right, great job.